Well, good morning again. It's good to see all of you uh, in the way that we can. Uh, thank you again for uh, coming online and uh, watching this service. I'm going to adjust a few things here and there. Um, I just want to say how grateful I am to God for seeing us through uh, another week uh, and uh, to, um, to his having made it possible for us to do things like this. It is awesome to be able to um, to be able to meet online like this, uh, just think a few years back, we wouldn't have been able to do this. If we were shut down, we'd be shut down. So I'm grateful to God uh, that this technology is available. So one of the things that I want to do uh, is thank him uh, for all that he's made, you know, it possible for us uh, to do these days. And I also am hoping that uh, pretty soon we'll be able to take your prayer requests in person and uh, you know, make sure that your concerns are brought to God. Uh, I hope you're doing that yourself, but I mean publicly as well. Uh, I wanna thank you for your faithful giving to the church. I do get to see numbers still from time to time, and I'm grateful for, for what you're doing in uh, returning a faithful tithe to God and giving to a local church offering. Thank you for doing that. It, it makes a difference. And I, I need you to know it is making a difference in the conference office as well. I also want to tell you that uh, camp meeting is coming up this next week, uh, a virtual camp meeting. Lee Vinden is one of the featured speakers. And I, I hope that soon we can have uh, Judy send out some information uh, to you that you could access via the computer. Uh, and you could um, enjoy, even participate in a virtual camp meeting. Um, I also will make sure that it gets posted onto uh, Facebook and so on, uh, so that uh, you can access that and uh, watch him. He's a dynamic speaker. I enjoy him myself. Looking forward to, to hearing what he has to say. And then, of course, I'm sure you're wondering when we're going to reopen the church. I hope, but I, I'm not certain, but I hope that we can maybe reopen, not this coming Sabbath, or this Sabbath, uh, I'm recording this Thursday, so not this coming Sabbath, the Sabbath you're hearing this sermon, but hopefully the next week. I am in the process of writing a comprehensive uh, COVID-19 plan, which I have to, or someone of the church has to write out and post at the church uh, so that uh, if any health officials drop by, they can see it. Uh, that plan is very comprehensive, so I need to cover a variety of things, and then I need to get it all approved by the church board before we can reopen. It's not just a matter of, you know, keeping to uh, below 50 or, or below 100 if you're outdoors, uh, but it's more than that. We have to know exactly how to handle uh, COVID-19 on site, uh, whether indoors or outdoors. And we also need to know if someone is infected and so on, what we need to do. So we'll be writing up this plan. I hope to finish it. I hope tomorrow, if possible, if not, certainly this weekend. And then we can get the church reopened. Uh, so thank you for being patient. Uh, it's been a little harder for me to, to do some of this. Um, my brain is starting to function better now that they've removed a lot of that infection, or I should say pus, really. Um, the infection itself, they said, has to heal on its own. So that's why my brain is not immediately you know, relieved uh, of all headaches and uh, all uh, pressure. Uh, that hopefully will take place, and uh, in another uh, five months, they're going to scope me out and let me know whether the infection actually uh, did heal up uh, or whether or not it, you know, it returns, uh, which I hope it doesn't, frankly. But anyway, uh, I'm grateful to God for what he's done for all of us. And uh, thank you for being a part of the City Church. Uh, I wanna share with you a story uh, from the book of Genesis. And there is no doubt in my mind 
that the story of Genesis 22 disturbs people. And yet at the same time, it has inspired people because it's beautifully written and it makes people think incredibly deeply. It captures our attention. So I'm gonna to go to a screen share at this time and uh, then um, you'll be able to see what I'm seeing. All right, here we go. So Genesis 22 has really inspired a lot of people because of how beautifully it's written uh, and how deep its message, it captures people's attention. Hugely speaking, it has captured the attention of big name famous artists who painted its various scenes. Gustave Doré, Rembrandt, Johann Lys and Ludovico Caracci. I mean, look at the beauty of these uh, paintings drawings. I mean, they're priceless, incredible. But artists are not the only ones who are captivated by the story of Abraham and Isaac. Equally big name philosophers have wrestled with this story, mostly because of its clear association with, with what is often called the divine command theory, and a very important way of looking at the very heartbeat of morality. Famous philosophers from the past like Plato and William of Ockham, who was famous for, you know, Ockham's razor as it's known in logic. Uh, Thomas Aquinas and, and Gottfried Leibniz. Leibniz is the guy who wrote that, you know, our world is the best of all possible worlds that God has created. And Aquinas has written quite a bit of stuff on God and, and, and the existence of evil and the divine command theory. Immanuel Kant has, has, has written a great deal of stuff. Voltaire has tackled this subject. In fact, Voltaire wrote something that I just recently read for the very first time. It was amazing to me. Uh, it's a, a very, uh, how can I say this? Uh, a very deep poem uh, that he wrote because of uh, the Lisbon earthquake. Now the Lisbon earthquake is important to Seventh-day Adventists because we think it is prophetic. It's the great earthquake found in, in um, prophetic books in the Bible that was to occur before Jesus would return. And yet uh, Voltaire uses the Lisbon earthquake to discuss uh, the existence of evil in the face of a, of a good God, of an omnipotent and omniscient God. How does this kind of evil exist? It's incredible. And if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, you should read it um, because of the Lisbon earthquakes association with our prophetic scheme. But uh, there's more. There are other people who also spoke, you know, uh, spoke about the divine command theory and, and about the story of uh, Abraham and Isaac. David Hume, for example, a big time philosopher, Augustine of Hippo, uh, jo Alvin Platinga, a guy many of you may not know of, but he has written the free will defense and literally it is the, uh, <laughs> it's been tweaked a little over time, but it is the big defense uh, defending God uh, and free will in the face of evil. Um, he's very famous. Eleanor Stump, a female a philosopher who has written stuff I've recently read, uh, very, very smart uh, uh, philosopher. And then there's the Adams family. Uh, no, not that Adams family, but Robert and Marilyn Adams, a husband and wife Catholic team that have written uh, on this subject. He has a book uh, sitting right next to me called Finite and Infinite Goods, and uh, I'm going to read it this summer. Uh, it's apparently got some deep things that, that I think I need to learn. Uh, they've commented on uh, things like this story. He has a chapter uh, on this story in Genesis 22. John Hick wrote about soul-making theodicy, a uh, uh, famous guy. William Hasker, uh, Philip Van Inwagen, um, I think that's how he pronounces his name. I could be wrong. It could be Inwagen. Uh, it depends on, I guess, whether he's German or something like that. But uh, he has an article I'm about to read just this weekend, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. William Lane Craig. These are big-name philosophers 
and they're highly regarded uh, people either in the past or, or current ones and they have at one time or another wrestled with the divine command theory so you may be saying well what is that mike you know what is the divine command theory well in essence it states that morally good actions are morally good simply because God chooses them. Now there's an alternative to the divine command theory that some find much more attractive. It's called the guided will theory. And it states that God chooses morally good actions because they are independent of his choosing them morally good. Now you may say, well, so what? What's the, what's the main difference between them? Well, the latter, for example, if God chooses X because it is good, means that morality is independent of God. And if X is good because God chooses it, then morality is or seems arbitrary. Now, the battle between these two ideas is known as the Euthyphro Dilemma. And it's a name that's given to it thanks to a discussion that is couched uh, between Plato's famous, you know, character and, and former teacher Socrates and a man named Euthyphro. Euthyphro was prosecuting his father because he thought it was the right thing to do. And Socrates asked him, how do you know what's right and what's wrong? And Euthyphro's answer was, the gods determine what is right and what is wrong. And Socrates disagreed. So, as I said, to the right of the arrows on the screen are hints regarding the possible outcomes of believing in these two radically different theories of morality. And here they are again with their respective names. To affirm the divine command theory is to say that something is good or bad simply because God says so which suggests to many that there is nothing that is inherently good or bad, and thus there is nothing that might explain God's choosing which acts to endorse and which acts to prohibit. Now, this obviously could portray an infinitely arbitrary God. On the other hand, the other theory also poses a massive problem. To affirm the guided will theory is to locate the authority of morality outside of God. Now, for many Christians, this is a serious ouch. Now, you might be thinking that no Seventh-day Adventist would ever believe the guided will theory, but not so. In an editorial piece, E.J. Wagner, co-editor of the Signs of the Times, wrote about the difference, as he saw it, between God as a lawmaker versus God as a lawgiver. For him, if God was a lawmaker, then God's laws would be arbitrary. But if God was a lawgiver, merely passing on the laws of the universe, then these laws were objective and God was not arbitrary. Now, Wagner's concern was to keep God from being understood as arbitrary, and I think that's a worthwhile goal and pursuit. But in, in adopting the language that he did, he was actually, Wagner was actually co-opting one, uh, one of Ellen White's terms for God, that God is a lawgiver. But now, in using the term to show God in what he thought was a better light, Eliot was basically making God into a second-class deity one who was less than the moral authority of so-called reality. By adopting and promoting this idea, Wagner was in essence saying that God's only role is to teach people the good that simply exists in reality, thus placing the authority of morality outside of God. Ouch and serious ouch. Hmm. So there is an awful lot at stake in this argument. A ton of things are at stake in this argument and literally thousands of people have weighed in on one side or the other down through time. So if we choose the latter, the one with the yellow arrow, which is labeled the divine command theory, then how are we going to defend it and even defend God himself against the charge of arbitrariness? 
For it's not enough to simply say that because God is now consistent in doing it. No, we have to go all the way back to the nature of the command itself. Is the command arbitrary from its very get-go? Now that is a both deep and potentially troublesome question. Plus, in this case, how will we defend God and the divine command theory, especially in the face of what is often called the abhorrent command objection? Well, how does the story of Abraham and Isaac fit into this massive philosophical disagreement that has been going on for thousands of years. Well, in order to defend the divine command theory, we have to address our darkest fear about God's commands. The fear that God may command us to do something evil. That God might command us to do something we find utterly abhorrent, completely repugnant, and perhaps even morally wrong. And worse yet, in the case of Abraham uh, sacrificing Isaac, God himself later said that sacrificing a human being was morally wrong. So why would God, you know, command Abraham to do it while telling everyone else never to do it? Now, certainly some of the things that God has been thought to require have been evil. But does God command people to actually do evil things? The story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac has always dominated this discussion. Way back thousands of years ago and still today, this is the go-to story for everyone, for you and me, and yes, even for big time philosophers. Now, I understood the rough outline of this dilemma even when I was four or five years old. That was back when my parents first became interested in Adventism and I began reading the Bible for the first time for myself. Very early on, this question absolutely overwhelmed me. Will God command my parents to kill me as he commanded Abraham to kill Isaac? Now, you may not think a four or five year old could entertain such a such question, but I know I sure did. So if God would do that, why would anyone worship such a God? And why should I worship such a God is what I asked myself, even though I was only four or five years old. Now, I never told anyone that I harbored these questions because I thought these questions suggested that I could never be a person of faith. But instead, I was doomed to be a perennial doubter. Likely, I was doomed to be an even incurable unbeliever. But the story of Abraham and Isaac shook me as a kid. And it shakes a lot of people uh, still today. So let us begin our study of the story that has inspired, motivated, and troubled the best and brightest artists and philosophers this world may have ever known. Let's pray. Father God, would you be with us just now as we study your word together? Thank you for doing that. And thank you, Lord, for uh, addressing our personal concerns and our needs. Thank you for helping us to be people of faith. And God, would you teach us through this story much more than ever you've ever taught us before? Thank you for giving us this story. Thank you that we have an opportunity to uh, to, to hopefully open church again soon. I pray that you'll help us get that done and that you'll keep us safe when we do it. Thank you for answering this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis 22. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham. And he replied, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering, 
and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And so the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son, Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. As it is said on this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord. Because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you, and I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies. And by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth gain blessing for themselves, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Be'er Sheva, and Abraham lived at Be'er Sheva. These first two verses of our story contain a wealth of information that we need to digest. Ten or more years have gone by since Hagar and Ishmael were sent away, Isaac is either in his late teens or perhaps even in his early 20s. In other words, Isaac is now of marriageable age, which is going to explain the, the, why the rest of the chapter, you know, which we haven't read yet, contains information about Isaac's soon-to-be wife's family because he's nearing marriageable age. He is there. He's right there now, actually. So at this point, we learn that God tested Abraham. Why? Why did God test Abraham? Well, it, it seems pretty clear through all the stories we've read so far that Abraham doubted God's power. Twice, he claimed that uh, Sarah, his wife, was actually his sister, just to be able to keep himself safe when you think he could trust God to keep him, you know, keep him safe. Uh, once he said, Eleazar is going to be my heir, that was his servant, because God, you haven't given me a son, Eleazar is going to be my heir. He took Hagar as his secondary wife. He laughed at God when God promised him a son. And uh, he said at that point, oh, that Ishmael might live before you, God. In other words, that Ishmael might be my heir. And, of course, he did not want to send Ishmael away. It was very troublesome for him to even think about it. So even though God gave them, you know, ultimately the son he promised them, God's gift did not in and of itself remove Abraham's doubt. And that's the part I think we often forget. 
Yes, they had the son, but that didn't miraculously remove their doubt. But there's more. Even though God gave them the son he promised them, God's gift did not in and of itself remove their doubt. God alone can motivate and empower us, you know, to kick our doubt to the curb, but he cannot remove it for us. We alone can and, and must do that using the motivation and strength that God gives us. We ourselves must choose to lay aside our doubts, but God, you know, first does his part so that we can then do our part. So in this verse, Exodus 20, 20, uh, we read, don't be afraid, Moses told the Israelites, for God has come in this way to test you, and so that your fear of him will keep you from sinning. The point being that there, there is a benefit to be gained by being tested. And that benefit is so that we'll be able better to be people of faith, and, and so through faith in God, uh, be able to discipline ourselves, control ourselves, and, and, and jettison sin. The testing process is meant by God to not only reveal to us the resources that God has to motivate and empower us to shed our doubt, but it is while we are being tested that we choose whether to lay aside our doubt. And so this seems to be the case for, for Abraham. Now, when God first addressed Abraham to test him, God, I mean, Abraham immediately responded to God's voice. Abraham had heard God speaking to him many times before, and he knew it was God when God did speak to him. Now, in John chapter 10, Jesus said that uh, the sheep follow their shepherd because they know his voice. And the clear implication implication of that passage is that people who follow God know it is God when he speaks to them. It is not someone else. And Abraham recognized God's voice speaking to him. And Abraham immediately and positively responded to God. Here I am, he said. Well, in a clause that ratchets up the intensity with almost every word, God laid out the test for Abraham. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and offer him as a burnt offering. The first horror of the test is that it involved Isaac, the promised son, the boy who was to inherit everything that Abraham owned, the boy whom God had also staked his own reputation uh, on being a follower of God as he grew up. Uh, as was his father Abraham, uh, that boy, Isaac, the very one whom Abraham loved, that boy was the first horror of the test. How could Isaac inherit all that Abraham owned? I mean, how could he father a huge nation of people as God had promised? How could God ask Abraham to kill his son, to kill his son upon whom everything rested. How could God do that? Let alone ask him to murder the son he loved. So you can imagine a huge emotional battle was part of what was at stake. The second horror of the test, of course, is offering Isaac as a burnt offering. For burnt offerings were slaughtered and then entirely burned. There was nothing left when you were done. So Abraham, no doubt, was tempted to believe that it was not God asking him to do this. Yet to doubt the voice that he had always recognized as God speaking to him before was really to doubt everything he knew regarding God. Well, with a myriad of painful questions, no doubt, swirling inside his head, Abraham once again rose early in the morning. He did not hesitate for even a moment. And this is one of the things that I admire about Abraham. I, it's confounding to me, but I admire it nevertheless. And for three days, Abraham's heart, no doubt, hammered in his chest. Bam, 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 bam. 
every moment of every day. His mind worried and gnawed on everything he knew about God. And he recited, I'm sure, God's promises over and over to himself. And then all his wonderings that God was the one who was actually speaking to him, directing him to sacrifice his son, all of these questions seemed to change when Abraham saw the place where God had directed him to go. This confirmed to Abraham that God was leading in his life and was leading in this particular experience of his life. And the only way that Abraham could sort out what was happening was to believe that after he sacrificed Isaac, then God would resurrect his son and they would go home together. And that is why Abraham told his two young men that we, meaning Abraham and Isaac, will worship and we, Abraham and Isaac, will come back to you. Abraham did not expect to come back from the mountain alone. Isaac would be with him. And this is what this passage teaches, and the New Testament teaches us the very same thing. We read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. Now, our own Ellen Light commented on this in several passages, and here's one of them. Signs of the Times, April 1, 1875. She wrote, Abraham assured his son that God's promise that in Isaac shall your seed be called would be, would be fulfilled. That doubtless God would raise him to life again from the dead. He told Isaac that he had hope that the Messiah would spring from him. And I want you to note that last part about Isaac becoming the possible ancestor of the Messiah. It's an important idea, I think, in the story. Well, just as Jesus had Calvary's cross laid on his shoulders, so Isaac had the wood responsible for his own sacrifice laid on his shoulders. But Isaac did not know this yet. Abraham's mind, though, was still focused very much on the horrible deed that he must do. And so his mind was on the implements that he himself carried, the fire and the knife. When Isaac cried out, my father, I'm sure Abraham, Abraham's heart nearly gave away. I mean, these words accented the, the close relationship between them. You know, you've heard the word Abba. Well, that's the word here, Avi, Avi. And I'm sure this word, you know, accented their close relationship. And it stirred even more anguish up in, in Abraham's heart. But Abraham was not... <laughs> not even then silent, uh, interestingly enough, but rather he responded just as quickly, just as surely as when he had earlier responded to God. Here I am, my son, he said. In most things, Abraham was lightning quick to do the right thing. Are you and I li lightning quick to do the right thing? Like Abraham, are we lightning quick? But unlike Abraham, Isaac's mind was on a bit of a combination, not only on what he was packing, the wood, but also on the fire that his father was carrying that would set the wood that was on his shoulders aflame. But Isaac's mind also began wrestling with another problem. Where was the sacrificial lamb? And so the words here, God himself, God himself will provide the lamb, is not quite as accurate as the translation, God will provide himself as the lamb, which I think may be a little bit more accurate. God will provide himself as the lamb. But both of those phrases still get across the idea that a lamb would be provided. And what Abraham meant by this at this particular time, honestly, is a bit mysterious. It's as if Abraham suddenly and unknowingly predicted something different than he himself thought might occur. He didn't think that, uh, you know, there's some kind of a, that God was going to intervene and give them a, another uh, creature to sacrifice. He thought 
that God was going to resurrect Isaac. So it's a little mysterious. And I don't think that Abraham was lying in order to keep Isaac in the dark, you know, for a longer period. I think that like Caiaphas in the New Testament, Abraham was expressing a deep truth that even he did not quite understand. Well, once again, with the uh, clause, uh, when they came to the place that God had shown him, once again, our narrator confirms that God is leading throughout this experience. And so Abraham, without any hesitation, began building the altar and then, you know, laying the wood on it. Now, stories have what are called gaps. There is no story ever told that doesn't have a lot of gaps in it. Gaps which the mind is able to usually fill all on its own. Uh, and in fact, it, it makes the reader participate in the story. But there's a huge gap in our story right here. For given uh, Isaac's maturity, uh, it seems that Abraham must have told Isaac what was really happening at this point. And Isaac must have willingly agreed to be sacrificed. Now, why do I say that? Well, again, Isaac was around 20 years old and could have easily overpowered his older father or at least fled from the scene, but he did not. So the question then becomes, what child, what child believes so powerfully in the love of God and in the love of their earthly father and his relationship with God that they would put their life on the line like Isaac did? I mean, who does that? Isaac did. He willingly laid down his life. Now that has a resonance to Jesus' experience as well. Yet nevertheless, it is not, uh, it wasn't Isaac's faith that was being tested, it was his father's. And do you wonder if Abraham at that moment was finally, you know, catching on that it was his own character weaknesses that were the reason why this test was even occurring in the first place, let alone such a severe test? And if he did finally catch on at this moment, what kind of shame and guilt did that create in his mind and heart? Abraham was a heartbeat literally away from killing Isaac. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, right? God often waits until the very last moment to rescue us from danger. That way we won't personally take the credit or give it to someone else other than God. And here we see that principle in action once again in all of its horror. But with a great deal of urgency, the angel of the Lord cried out twice, not just once. Why? Because he needed to stop Abraham in his tracks in the very midst of his action. And the angel needed Abraham to know that it was the Lord speaking to him again. And thankfully, one more time, Abraham responded with the same quickness and sureness that he often did. Here I am. Whoo, right? You know, wipe the sweat away. Uh, wow, what an intervention at the last moment. And then Abraham was then told not to harm the boy in any way because it was evident that Abraham feared God. Well, how was it evident? Because Abraham had not withheld his son, his only son, from God. Abraham looked up and he saw the ram stuck in a bush and he took the ram and he sacrificed it instead of Isaac. And with this particular detail that it is a, a ram and not a lamb, it's with this particular detail that we see a powerful link between this story and the Day of Atonement ritual in Leviticus chapter 16. In fact, there are actually quite a few linguistic links between this story and the Day of Atonement ritual, and for good reason. But once again, the angel of the Lord called out, swearing by himself that because Abraham had not withheld his only son, that God would bless him with a blessing that would be so vast that it would literally bless all the nations of the earth. 
Now in context, this is certainly a messianic promise. But we might also ask ourselves the importance of God swearing by himself rather than by swearing by some outside reality of goodness that God only teaches, but God himself did not create, such as in the guided will theory. Would being second to reality still make God swear by himself? Or does God swear by himself because there is nothing greater, nothing better than God? Well, in the book of John, chapter 8, verse 56, Jesus speaking said, Your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. And I think Abraham prayed that he might see the Messiah. And I believe God revealed the Messiah to him on that fateful day. Well, this is where I think most of you would like me to end, right? Nice ending. But I've got a few more slides to discuss, three of them, I think. First of all, I think God had good reasons for testing Abraham's faith. <laughs> And there seems to be a strong correlation between Abraham's doubts and what God orchestrated with the sacrifice of Isaac. Abraham finally, you know, coming to believe that God could raise someone from the dead, I think fits nicely into believing that God could also make even old, infertile people have a child. But, it, but all that does not make for an easy view of morality. So let me say that again. None of that makes uh, for an easy view of morality. I admit that God needed to test Abraham, but still, but still. Rather than try to show that God was not the one, I want to say that again, rather than try to show that God was not the one who commanded Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, I have instead highlighted that. I think the story itself seems to do that. But the divine command theory, which is what many Christians believe is true, that divine command theory is a lot harder to swallow if God commands people to do actually evil things, doesn't it? So what shall we do with such a belief? Shall we jettison it for something better? Shall we learn how to express the divine command theory in better ways? If we adopt the guided will theory instead, it seems to me we basically thrown God under the bus, saying that he is less than something else that either dictates or creates reality, whatever else that might be. Or we adopt the divine command theory and God appears arbitrary, and in this case, even worse. For in the story of Abraham and Isaac, God even appears self-contradictory. So having said that out loud, so you could hear it and even recorded it, no less, are you uncomfortable yet? Because I know I am. I mean, couldn't God have found some other way to help Abraham exercise a true and strong belief than this? And what, if anything, should we do with our broadest, most foundational ideas of morality? Well, join us next week as we discuss some of this a bit more. Happy Sabbath to all of you. Sorry uh, for leaving you hanging, but I guess that's what storytellers do. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much that you made it possible for Abraham to be a person of faith. Would you help us to be people of faith? But God, there are also issues in this story that deeply trouble us. And would you help us understand some of these things better, including how, how we should understand, you know, the foundations of morality. Please guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us this Sabbath. We'll see you again next week hopefully, maybe even in person. Bye-bye. Have a great Sabbath.